Close your eyes for a moment and imagine the perfect seaside vacation. You travel to a fashionable coastal resort for a weekend of sun, sand, and surf. When it's time to hit the beach, you even have the privilege of using a private, mobile changing room that rolls right down to the water's edge. Unfortunately, the towels are dirty, the floor is damp, and you are legally required to change into a swimsuit more accurately described as a thick, heavy outfit covering you from neck to toe before a burly stranger suddenly opens the door and throws you into the ocean. Oh, I almost forgot to mention, you don't know how to swim. I have just described the experience of using an invention known as the bathing machine. For more than a century, these strange devices littered the beaches of France, Germany, Belgium, Mexico, and the United States, although they were most popular in Victorian Britain. Some were little more than wooden crates on wheels, while others were extravagant affairs fitted out with the most modern conveniences and lavish decorations. Regardless of the quality of the absurd apparatus, your experience was likely to be a very, very uncomfortable one. Today, we turn to a particularly waterlogged chapter of The Data Combs to discuss the history of the device responsible for ruining countless vacations, the bathing machine. The curious contraption that would come to be known as the bathing machine is first mentioned in Devon around the year 1735. Before this time, it was common for men and women to bathe together in the nude, as there were no garments specifically designed for swimming. Unfortunately, the Brazilian bikini had yet to be invented. People swam not for pleasure or for sport, but for their health, believing that a vast array of ailments could be cured by brisk salt water and fresh ocean air. The publication of Dr. Richard Russell's wildly popular Use of Seawater in the Diseases of the Glands in 1752 further cemented this belief, suggesting that water could be used as a form of therapy and encouraging the public not only to bathe in seawater, but to drink it as well. I recommend that you do not follow the latter part of his dubious advice. Seaside resort towns soon began to spring up throughout Britain, built to cash in on the new health craze of taking the waters. With the arrival of thousands of genteel patrons came the bathing machine, a device designed to preserve the modesty of female beachgoers by allowing them to take the waters safely hidden from the prying male gaze. These bathing machines, or vans, were made of wood or canvas stretched over a wooden frame. A typical model would measure about six feet long, five feet wide, and eight feet high, standing four feet off the ground and supported by four large wheels. An 1847 issue of the Traveler's Miscellany and Magazine of Entertainment described bathing machines as an aquatic caravan consisting respectively of two towels, two rickety hat pegs, a damp flooring, a strong smell of seaweed, and a broken looking glass. The invention is sometimes erroneously accredited to a Quaker by the name of Benjamin Beale, a maker of gloves and breeches for Margate. While he did not invent the bathing machine itself, he did design a canvas hood that could be lowered from the seaside door, fully enclosing the bather for the greatest possible privacy. Designs varied greatly. Some were lavishly decorated, while most were windowless affairs with simple painted interiors, their exteriors plastered with advertisements for soap and beauty products. In addition to canvas hoods, some had small covered porches or railed stairs. Even large family-sized versions were made. 
Wealthy patrons enjoyed bathing machines with gabled roofs, glazed skylights, and curtained windows. The Queen magazine wrote of one private bathing machine to be found at Trouveau, which is furnished to provide the utmost luxury for the bather, noting the extravagance of the interior. Wall hangings and door curtain in red Turkish sails cloth, veiled with ecru fish netting and finished off with ball fringe, along with a valance to match, carried round the draped ceiling and looped up with bows to form a wall pocket. Drapery round the looking glass, windows, dressing table, and chair. Silk blinds embroidered with crest and interlaced monogram. Fans, flowers, foot bath, and folding stool. San Francisco's morning call newspaper tells of an American woman who created her own version of the luxurious bathing machines she had seen on the continent. The interior is all done in snow white enamel paint, and one half of the floor is pierced with many holes to allow a free drainage from wet flannels. The other half of the little room is covered with a pretty green Japanese rug. There are large bevel edge mirrors let into either side of the room, and below one juts out a toilet shelf on which is every appliance. There are pegs for towels in the bathrobe, and fixed in one corner is a little square seat that, when turned up, reveals a locker where clean towels, soap, perfumery, etc. are stowed. Ruffles of white muslin trimmed with lace and narrow green ribbons decorate every available space. King George III and his large family made use of a royal floating bathing machine, described in a 1792 account as a large structure resembling a houseboat or floating dock, with three dressing rooms and three large baths. It allowed the user to bathe in complete privacy and could be used in pretty much all weathers. It was covered by a roof and seawater flowed in through grills at each end. At one end of the structure were the royal bath and royal dressing room, and at the other end were baths and dressing rooms for the use of the king's guests. The royal party was attended by a team of dippers who wore bandeaus with the motto, God save the king, on their bonnets and around their waists. King Alfonso VIII of Spain enjoyed the most ostentatious bathing machine of all time, one large enough to accommodate his wife, children, and the entire royal party, as well as their bathing attendants, in unrivaled luxury. The massive structure consisted of two enclosed gazebos with striped dome roofs and high arched windows flanking either side of the central entrance. The faux brick facade was elaborately decorated with intricate lattice work, a covered patio, and ornate electric post lights. A promenade deck with multiple sets of banister staircases wrapped around the entire structure, which was topped off with a gilded crown ornament. It was so heavy that two sets of iron rails were required to raise and lift the machine via a steam-powered pulley system. Unfortunately, no photographs or descriptions of the interior survive, and the structure was demolished in 1911. Queen Victoria's bathing machine was quite modest by comparison. It was made of slatted wood topped by a pitched roof with finely carved steps leading up to a shaded veranda. It was painted a rich forest green with black wheels and ivory trim, decorated by wrought iron scrollwork and large curtained windows. A personal bathing attendant and a plumbed-in lavatory further ensured the queen's comfort. Victoria wrote of her first use of the machine, which was also the first time she had ever bathed in the sea, in a journal entry dated the 14th of July, 1847. I thought it delightful till I put my head under water when I thought I should be stifled. As the moral conventions of the Victorian era began to take hold, proper beach etiquette became more strictly enforced. In 1832, a new law was passed prohibiting mixed gender bathing, also known as promiscuous bathing. Male and female bathers were to be segregated, with no less than 60 feet between their respective beach areas. Separate but equal bathing machines were available for both men and women, though their use was strictly enforced for the gentler sex. The owners of these contraptions were required to provide appropriately prudish swimwear for female bathers, while their male counterparts were permitted to swim freely in only their drawers. How exactly were these bathing machines used, one might ask? Let us explore the process. Guests would pay a small fee, about nine pence in 1770, or five US dollars today, 
though the price was higher in the off-season, then sign on to a waiting list at the wooden office of the Master Bathing Woman, where one could leave their valuables for safekeeping. Once called to take their turn, the user entered their designated machine, changing out of their street clothes and into a set of swimwear known as a bathing costume. Early Victorian bathing costumes consisted of long wool dresses with tightly buttoned cuffs and close-fitted bodices, which were worn over corsets. They were made from thick material, dyed dark navy or black, to prevent any chance of the garment becoming sheer. These fabrics were also highly absorbent, becoming incredibly heavy and bulky in the water, and hindering the wearer's ability to swim. Despite this, weights were sewn into the skirts as an extra precaution to prevent them from floating up in the water. The first two-piece bathing outfits were introduced in the 1860s, consisting of knee-length belted dresses and ankle-length trousers. These ensembles often had sailor-style collars and were decorated with buttons, fringe, and red or white striped trim. Both types of bathing costume were worn with dark stockings and lace-up shoes. Attractive straw bonnets decorated with ribbons and flowers completed the look. Once the lady had changed into an appropriate outfit, the bathing machine would be lowered towards the ocean, pulled either by manpower or by a horse. The wooden box shook violently as it rolled over pebbles and rocks, much to the discomfort of the occupant. An 1865 publication entitled All About Margate and Hearn Bay writes of one group of Victorian vacationers' experience. We, after a time, find ourselves in possession of a machine with a blue door and a very wet carpet inside, and feel ourselves insulted by having two towels handed to us, which are no larger than sheets of blotting paper. Just as we were about to remonstrate, the jolting box began to move, and we were sent bumping about from side to side, like a weaver's shuttle. It is worse than riding in a hay cart, and impresses us with the belief that we are being stifled like cinders. Those who could not swim, which included the vast majority of people of the Victorian era, relied on the services of professionals. These dippers, as they were called, would tie a thick rope around the swimmer's waist and anchor it to the van before forcefully pushing their hapless victim into the sea. Dippers had to be enormously strong in order to lift ladies in their heavy, waterlogged bathing gowns back out of the water. In his ritual pleasures of a seaside resort, Chris Jenks described these women as technicians of the ritual process, on-site masters of the requirements of the sea bathing treatment. They judged the waves, the state of their clients, and their daily requirements, noting that they were essential figures of dependable strength and assurance. So respected were these essential figures that some even became local celebrities. One such person was Martha Gunn, known as the Venerable Priestess of the Bath who served as a dipper from 1750 until 1814, when ill health forced her to retire at the ripe old age of 88. She was so well known that the Prince of Wales granted her free access to his kitchens and hung a formal portrait of Martha in the Royal Pavilion at Brighton. Despite the aid of dippers, some women did not survive their day at the beach. On August 12th, 1871, the Illustrated Police News reported that one Mrs. Sylvester got into difficulties in the water and was at once carried into the bathing machine. She gave a faint sigh and expired almost immediately. Another unfortunate victim that summer was Sarah Bell, aged 46, who died in a bathing machine at Great Yarmouth. She too had got into difficulties and exclaimed, oh dear, oh dear, I shall die, as she was assisted back into her bathing machine. In both cases, the ladies were declared to have died of natural causes and the bathing machine was completely exonerated from any blame. The vast majority of Victorian vacationers survived their seagoing experience, although it was unlikely to have been an enjoyable one. After returning to the relative safety of the bathing machine, ladies would remove their drenched costumes and change back into street clothing. The user then raised a flag to signal to the attendant that she had finished dressing, at which point the machine would be hauled back up onto the beach. As one could imagine, the experience of taking the waters in a bathing machine was far from the highlight of any seaside vacation. A journalist for the Bystander magazine voiced the sentiments of many when he declared, The bathing machine is the stupidest device ever thought of outside Bedlam. Fortunately for us, the enforced use of these uncomfortable, obtuse, and occasionally deadly contraptions would not last forever. 
The legal segregation of British beaches ended in 1901, and with it, the age of the bathing machine. Although these strange contraptions could still be found on the sands of seaside resorts well into the 1920s, their use swiftly declined after the international calamity known as World War I. Many became no more than relics of Victorian modesty, repurposed as stationary changing huts, garden sheds, and hay carts. Following her death, Queen Victoria's own bathing machine was used as a chicken coop, but has since been restored and returned to its original home on the beach at Osborne House on the Isle of Wight. I imagine she would be utterly fucking horrified to see today's carefree, uncorseted beachgoers enjoying the sun and surf in their micro-thong bikinis. <laughs>